Um, so I guess I'll start from the top. Um, I'll cover kind of the effects of incarceration and living in carceral spaces, um, dehumanization, activism in carceral spaces, and a little bit of what I could really use help on, um, what, what, what I need from you. And as this is lunchtime, um, you're a little bit close together, but if you could, I just like to take a quick stretch because uh, <laughs> we're going to be getting it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Get a good stretch in there. Yeah, a little bit of chair yoga is a good way to start any session. <laughs> because even though um, we're going to be covering some kind of heavy topics, uh, there, there's no need to be miserable. And I don't want to make your lunchtime that way. Uh, so I like to start on kind of a lighter note. Um, and then jump right off the cliff <laughs> into the effects of incarceration. Um, so initially, there is the physical separation from your family, right? And you automatically become a burden on them. And you know this from the very first day, from, from the time that those handcuffs are going on, the time that you step into that jail, you know you are automatically a burden to your family. It doesn't matter how much they tell you that's not the case. It doesn't matter how much they try to reassure you that they love you and they're here for you through all of it. Every single day, every time you pick up the phone, every time you pick up a pen to write a letter, that is your reality, right? You have failed your family. You have failed your community. You have failed everybody that you called friend. And that is your new reality. Every day that you wake up, you are a failure. And it sounds like everyone in person knows uh, the term carceral spaces, uh, but for those who don't, um, carceral is basically anything related to incarceration or prison. So that's, uh, I'll be using that consistently through this as this is, um, it's important to introduce this language and um, maintain it. So, A big piece of the narrative around um, incarceration, around prison, around crime and punishment is that this retributive idea that, um, we are, that we need to pay our debt to society, right? That we are being incarcerated, we are being punished in order for us to pay our debt to society. But what people don't understand is that society is currently paying my debt to society. Yeah. That is what is happening right now with my incarceration. You, if you pay taxes in Maine, you are paying my debt to society. And for those of us who have reached a certain level of growth, we understand this. And it becomes a constant source of frustration, right? That we are supposed to be paying our debt to society. We are supposed to be bringing healing into our communities, but we can't. We are hamstrung by the system and any uh, efforts towards seeking forgiveness, uh, taking accountability, trying to right our wrongs, we're stuck. We can't. So we do what we can within the spaces that we have. And that really goes back to the foundation of the American criminal justice system being one of retributivism, right? Saying that you harmed, you created harm in society. So therefore, you need to receive harm in kind, right? In its ideal form, it is saying that the punishment will equal the harm created. But what it does in practice is it says that you harm someone, so we are going to harm you for harming that person. And through this process, we are going to teach you that harming people is bad doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you break it down like that. And uh, there are actually studies that show that the death penalty in particular doesn't deter crime and can actually uh, reinforce the belief that it is right to create harm in order, it, it is right to create harm when you feel harmed, right? So again, that perpetuates these cycles of harm in community. And so that's a huge, um, 
difference between retributive and restorative justice. And, you know, there are a lot of talks around restorative justice. And there are people who feel really, really strongly one way or another about what restorative justice really means. So what that has done has actually created divisions within communities that are working towards an ultimate goal that is the same, similar if not the same, but we get caught up on the particulars, right? How do we reach that goal? Which is um, why we get such pushback whenever we're working on something like parole or anything that can be spun into the narrative of letting violent criminals out on the street early, right? Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but what this does, right, when you have harm inflicted on you for the harm that you created in society, because I did, I'm fully guilty of the crime that I committed, and that is something that it actually took five years for me to be able to speak out loud because of the traumatic foundation of why I committed my crime and the broken thinking that led to it. I couldn't reconcile who I thought I was with what I had done. So that led to a period of denial that was further encouraged by the criminal justice system, that as soon as you enter it, it tells you that you need to plead not guilty. These were instructions from my first defense lawyer. Uh, he said, you need to plead not guilty in order for us to have time to create a defense, or at the very least, to get you less time. So in the society where we value accountability so much, personal responsibility, right? the very system that we use to hold other people accountable teaches us to not hold ourselves accountable. So that fueled my series of lies and cycles of lies that I told so often that I started to believe them until I finally broke down five years afterwards and was finally able to admit who I was and be able to reconcile who I was with what I had done. And that was unfortunately a place that too many people don't reach because of the dehumanizing factors uh, that go into this experience. And I gave a talk um, in a recent presentation that we did through the Carter School on social death. Now, I'm not sure how familiar people are with that term, um, but according to Yana Krolova, this is my, uh, my go-to reference, uh, it's her contemporary social science article. And she defines it as, says that it occurs in cases where a person experiences a loss of social identity, a loss of social connectedness, and losses associated with disintegration of the body and all of those losses occur systematically as a person enters and moves through the system. So your identity, right? That which you hold close, that which you spend your entire life developing at the moment of your rest, because it's, it may not even be at the moment of your arrest. The moment that your name is connected to a crime in the media, whoever you were before that moment, that is no longer your identity. Your new identity is criminal. Doesn't matter who you were, doesn't matter what you did, didn't matter how much good you have done in other people's lives, doesn't matter if you were a star athlete, a professor, all of that goes out the window. For the rest of your life, Every time that your name is mentioned in the media, it will either be led with, closed with, or somewhere included in there, your crime. What you did, the amount of time that you served for it, and usually some implication uh, throughout the piece, whether that was fair or not. And that even leads into the natural death process, how it's being reported out. Right? When you look at the obituaries or the, um, the media reports around someone who dies in Maine State Prison, even those who we have cared for in hospice up until their last day, up until their last moment, um, it's not reported out as a natural death. 
it is reported out as Mr. or Mrs. Criminal has died in such and such prison who had committed this crime and was sentenced to this amount of time. And now they're dead, so you don't need to worry about them anymore. That tends to be the gist of it, unfortunately. And a lot of focus around dehumanization, speaking directly to carceral spaces, is that it is primarily about the offender, right? The person serving time. And what is often lost is that this system is designed in such a way that it dehumanizes everyone. The people who are incarcerated and everyone who works here directly or even indirectly, right? People who work in upper administration because there's this us versus them mentality, this narrative that is easily spun that there should be and cannot be any collaboration between an incarcerated person and someone and their captor, right? So there's that piece of things, but then there's the very real, the tangible aspect of coming into these spaces every day, especially for line staff. This experience weighs heavily on line staff because when they come in day after day and they see the size of the space that we live in, if you look at nothing else, if you look at the fact that you have oftentimes in the most of the cells in this prison are double bunked. And when you look at that size of maybe six and a half or seven feet by about 12 or 14, depending on where you are in the facility, that's about the size of a half bath in a house. And you are sharing this space, two whole grown men in this case, sharing a bathroom to live in. So when you come in and you see this every day, if you saw me as your brother, some, a member of your family, someone you work with, a coworker, right? Someone you go to school with. If that was how you viewed me every day, when you came in to see me and to talk to me, and then you had to leave every day, knowing that you're leaving me in these conditions, I don't care who you are. That would tear you up every single day. So in order to survive in this career, you need to harden your heart. You need to allow it to become calloused enough for you desensitized enough so that you can come in and leave every day in some form of sanity. That's the reality of it. So that's where a lot of the um, emphasis comes, right? The critiques around this prison in particular, um, but any prison that has any of these pacifiers, right? Of cable or video game systems, music instruments, right? That it's, oh, um, they did this in society, so they don't deserve to have access to these things. But in reality, those pacifiers are, are just that, right? They are mechanisms that keep us sedate. And when, again, when you reach that certain point of growth, you see them as what they are, and they become, to a point, almost reprehensible to you. For me, they become tools, right? TV is a means to stay informed of what's going on in society in snippets. Musical instruments are a method for me to reach people, right? It's a tool of my craft in the infirmary with hospice, right? Doing unofficial music therapy, right? Bringing joy through music. Um, and video games, video games is just a time suck. <laughs> um, but what that does is for a lot of guys, it gives you a place to lose yourself. And I lost myself in the first few years, just sucking up all of that pacifier. Just let me get every last bit of it. I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to work on me. I don't want to look at me. I can't look at myself. I don't know who I am. So when you're wrestling with all of these things and you're running from all of these things, it's best you have some place to run to. So when you have a PlayStation, when you have a TV, you can lose yourself in it until that doesn't become enough. 
and you realize how much of your humanity you have lost along the way, how much has been stripped from you through this process, and you get fed up. And unfortunately, as I move throughout this prison, I see so many people who are still there. They're still stuck. They're still not ready because there are not enough opportunities that are paired with guidance and support in order to be able to take advantage of those opportunities in a healthy way. Because your life has told you up until this point that every good and beautiful opportunity that is presented to you, every moment of joy will be stolen from you. That nothing good ever lasts. And if you allow yourself to enjoy it too much, if you allow yourself to get excited about something, then it's going to be taken from you because someone is going to see you enjoying it. So it's gone. That's the reality. So when people get these opportunities without the guidance, without the support, they think it's, they're going to lose it. So they milk it for all it's worth and they ruin it themselves. I did this. I know this. This is a pattern that I was very, very good at. My cycle ended up being about six months. Right? At times it was six weeks. And six months was a victory for me. Right? Where I needed to ruin my life so that no one else would ruin it for me. And that is the direct connection between the foster system and the prison system. Because every few weeks or every few months coming into the foster system, whenever I would get close to someone, whenever I would allow myself to care about someone, whenever I would allow somebody to reach my heart a little bit, it was time to move. They needed space in the place that I was living, or they ostensibly wanted to find me a better place for me to live. But what that did was create repeated separations, forced separations, after which each time I needed to deaden my heart. I needed to allow it to callous. And I actually, then that actually led to my dual diagnoses of um, emotional detachment disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. I received those diagnoses at 14. Because when every authority figure, or virtually every, I, I can't say everyone because there were some decent people along the way, right? But when key authority figures have violated that trust and created those wounds, you stop trusting authority in any form. You stop trusting teachers, you stop trusting foster parents, and you stop trusting any adult who says that they care about you. And when you stop trusting, and you only trust yourself, then you are trusting the self that is not yet fully formed. You are trusting the self that has not experienced life, who has not experienced failure, who has not experienced growth, who has not really experienced the fullness of what life is supposed to offer you. And that leads to faulty decisions. That leads to an inability to make well-rounded decisions which in my case led to directly to my crime, which has me incarcerated for 50 years. A sentence that I received, ironically, on the same day I received my GED in county at 19 years old. I'd been arrested five weeks after my 18th birthday. Five weeks. So from the age of 10 to now age 31, I've spent a total of five weeks of my life not as a ward of the state. That's my reality. Which fuels my activism, right? All of this dehumanization, all of these struggles, all of this suffering that I wake up and I see every day, that creates the space and the need, the pressing need for activism. Because eventually you wake up one day, for me it was a good friend of mine talking about how things will never change. And when I heard him say this, I heard myself say it. Because I had said it so many times up to this point, and this was maybe four years ago. It's very, very recent that this fed upness 
really, really set in for me. And so I got tired of hearing it because I realized that if you say things will never change, then things will never change. You can count on that. So it actually caused a rift in our relationship when I reached this point because I got mad and I said, listen, I'm, I'm not, I'm tired of hearing it. I'm tired of saying it because if we say that things won't change then they won't change. If we say that things will never get better then they will never get better. If we say that the staff and the administration will never be held accountable for where they go awry, then you're right. They will never be held accountable. If you say that government officials will never be held accountable for their self-serving decisions and protection of their careers, then you're right. That will continue to be our reality. So I got fed up with it. And that's where um, my very, very simple definition of activism comes in. For me, I break it down, right? It is simply standing up for what you stand for. It's really easy to say, I stand for justice. I stand for truth. I stand for equality. I stand for equity. But it's really difficult to stand up when you're the only one standing, right? It's easy to say, the okay, yes, I, I stand for justice. Okay, but you're sitting down in your nice comfy chair, in your nice comfy house, in your nice comfy house, looking at your nice big screen TV, talking about how much you care about justice. Congratulations, I'm happy for you. But what happens when you have an instance like a George Floyd or a Breonna Taylor, or the list goes on and on and on, Ahmaud Arbery and so on and so forth, Philando Castile, the list goes on, right? These are just the hot names of the moment, but if you peel back that media and you look at the list of names that exist, multiply that several times over, and you're just getting to the point of realizing how much violence has been visited upon people of color, right? It is a very, very long list that no one dares to keep, that very few dare to even try to start glancing at. So what are you going to do when faced with that injustice? What are you going to do when that injustice visits your community? When you have an innocent person that you know is innocent because you saw, a matter of fact, you bore a witness to the crime that was committed. And you see this, your neighbor arrested. And you see the media take hold of this and start crafting a story about how this person is an animal living amongst totally civilized people. But you know the truth. But you see the media frenzy growing around it. And you see your neighbor arrested. Do you have what it takes to speak out? Not just to go to the police and say, hey, this is something that I saw, but to track down the defense attorney, to follow up with the prosecutor, to reach out to the media, to really put your life at risk, your livelihood, your reputation at risk for what you know is right. That's going from one extreme to the whole other. I know this. <laughs> this is a very extreme case, right? But this happens. I just sent out, I just forwarded um, an email yesterday from the Innocent Project about Julius Jones, a man who, is, who has served over 20 years for a crime that he has maintained its innocence for for a crime where several witnesses have come forward saying that someone else committed the crime and there was actually another confession from someone else to the crime. And yet this man is still sitting in prison. He is on death row and he is scheduled for execution in November. This is out in Oklahoma. This is the reality of our system. This justice system that exists is not based on true justice, right? And true justice, right, for me, again, so this, is, so this is where I see there needs to be a redefinition societally of justice, right? Because we still feed into this retributive idea 
but our version of retributivism leans more toward vengeance. This person did harm in community, so whatever he gets for what he did is justified. Because at least he's not out harming people. The implied assumption there is that because someone created harm once, they will always create harm. So in our narrative around criminal justice, we strip from people who become incarcerated the possibility of rehabilitation, the possibility of transformation, the possibility of growth, of true change. Because according to my judge, Nancy Mills, right now, as I sit here talking to you, I am a severe threat to society. I'm an animal, I am a predator. If you let me out, I will break into homes, I will kill people, I will create harm. Left and right, I will be a menace to society. Because of one act, as horrible as it was, it was one act on one night, on one day of my life at 18 years old. Shortly after witnessing the death of my father, natural, but a whole lot of trauma led into that on the one year anniversary of me watching my foster mother take her last breath. And not being able to know how to heal from that trauma, not knowing how to mourn, not knowing how to grieve. So I lost myself in drinking and partying and women and anything that could numb pain that could enable me to not think, to not have to reflect, to not have to deal with all of the ineffable emotions that I didn't know how to deal with. So here I am, 13 years later, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, second year of my master's program, working on conflict analysis and resolution, with the focus on social justice advocacy and activism, with four years of professional development of restorative justice work, of working day in and day out throughout this institution, trying to help people, learning how to help people, and then actually helping people and continually learning and growing. I'm not 18, I'm a grown man. I am a very, very different person, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. I'm a new human being. But in society, I'm not. I'm still that 18 year old kid who did that horrible crime. I have a very rare opportunity here to have a voice beyond these walls. So in certain circles, right, people see the man that I am. But for the vast majority of society, I'm still that kid. I'm still that broken kid who did that horrible thing, but I'm not even that broken kid, I'm that grown man who made that conscious decision to harm an innocent family and nearly take two lives. Trauma is not a tangible defense. Mental health is borderline, but trauma has no space, no space in our criminal justice system, no space to breathe, no space to be heard. So, when I come to this realization over this past year or so, these past few years really, of how my trauma growing up led directly to me inflicting trauma, right? This cycle of trauma. When I finally started understanding these things, there's only so much I can do with it. There's a lot that I can do with it, but there's only so much I can do with it, right? That's what fuels the work that I do in every interaction that I have with people within these spaces is hoping to open people's eyes and their hearts and their minds to the impact that trauma has on people's lives and how whether you have come to any understanding of trauma and of how trauma has affected your life and your decisions, you're still affected by it. 
we are still affected by it every single day. So that's something that I do every day. Um, but it was only over the past year or so that I came to see myself as an activist, that I started allowing myself to embrace this idea of activism because it's dangerous in carceral spaces. There's a very, very fine line you need to walk because if you push too hard, too far, and too fast, the system will push back in the form of an officer, middle management, or administrator. You have a shelf life. And the harder you push and the farther and the faster, the shorter your shelf life is. But if you don't do enough, right, if you are seen having conversations with staff and administrators and there aren't enough tangible changes around you, then guess what? <laughs> Your so-called brothers in chains start calling you a lapdog for the administration. Doesn't matter how many sleepless nights you have, doesn't matter how hard you push, doesn't matter how much work you're putting in, doesn't matter how many people you are trying to get on board to work on this collaboration work that you're doing. If people can't see it, then all they see is you palling around with staff and administration. So it's a fine, it's a fine line that you need to walk. And that's not just true for those of us who are incarcerated. For volunteers who come in, they have a shelf life too sadly, and well, the system itself is changing and I pray that this is different moving forward because we do, we have a great administration right now who allow opportunities like this to come up and for me to be able to take opportunities like this. We are at a very different place, but the experience of the vast majority of the incarcerated men in this facility right now is that nothing has changed. Whenever any new initiative comes out, it's, oh, it's one more thing that's gonna be tried to try to find something fancy that administration can put their names on and things are gonna go back to the status quo. Life is going to remain miserable forever. That is their reality. I see this, I see this hope of these interactions. And I take this with me when I shut this camera off. But I'm one person. There are only so many people in here that I can interact with on any given day while I'm still fighting every fight that I have going at any given time. So it's difficult and it's hard and that's why I need help. I can't do it alone. And I tell this to everyone incarcerated in here and out there with you, right? All of this work that I'm doing, all of the hours of sleep that I miss are irrelevant if I'm just doing it by myself. Because if I'm standing up alone, it's real easy to knock me down. <laughs> Which for me takes me, you know, I, as a man of faith, it takes me to scripture, right? About how one standing alone is easily broken. But when you put two together, it is not as easily broken. And when you put three together, that is where your strength is, right? That goes back, that is the driving ethos of strength in numbers, right? But there needs to be collaboration. There needs to be a coherent vision of what that looks like. Because if you have a bunch of people standing together with no communication, no collaboration, then guess what? You're a whole bunch of lonely people standing together. <laughs> Nothing really gets done. So that's where it's important for our focus to be on building bridges, bridges of communication, bridges of collaboration. And what I need from you right? I'm in here. My internet time is limited. My access is limited. And every time that I interact with the community in a platform like this, I need to get a media release signed and, and approved by the administration, which is why I give them so much credit for letting things like this happen, right? Because there are so many men in here, women in the other facility, you have so many people who are incarcerated who have no voice. Their voice doesn't make it out of their cell. Oftentimes it doesn't even make it to the next person standing next to them because it's one more person complaining about the things that everyone knows are wrong. So I need your voice. I need your freedom and I need your courage. Your courage to use your voice and to use the freedom that you have to get involved with this work, right? 
personally, I would love it if everybody was working on my work, but this work isn't for everyone. This focus isn't for everyone, but there is so much injustice. There is so much wrong in this society that you can throw a rock and hit a worthy cause. Right? <laughs> you type a word in online and I can tell you right now, there's about 16 causes going on right now of something that is wrong. So find what fits you, find what speaks to your heart and get involved. Don't sit on that comfy couch in that comfy house in front of that comfy TV of yours and talk about what you stand for. Actually stand up for what you stand for. And if you'd like to get involved with some of the work that I do, um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and if you are willing to, if you could put your email in the chat, I send out information um, of different projects that I'm working on, keeping people updated on what I'm working on and what I need help on occasionally, sometimes a little bit more than occasionally. Uh, but I, I try to keep it manageable where we have momentum growing around this space. But again, I need help. So for those of you online, if you could put it in chat. Um, if not, I'll put my, um, I'll put my email out there, uh, so you can take it down, um, and just send me a short note, uh, saying that you'd like to be added to my support network. Um, and I'll put you down and you can see what's going on and see, see where you fit in, or if there's something that will spark, um, you know, what you would like to get involved in. Uh, and also I'm going to be a presenter, um, in the reentry mini conference that um, is being put on by the Carceral Society section of the Carter School's Transitioning Justice Lab. And I'll put that link. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> this is kind of a um, snag here. Uh, I don't have it readily available, but if you put your email in the chat, then I can send you the link if you're interested. Uh, and at that, I will say thank you very much um, for showing up and open the floor for questions. Um, comments and see where we go. Thank you. I know he knows that people have to leave for classes at one or the different space. I mean, if you want to ask questions, you're welcome. I have a question. <laughs> Maybe that can do you want to talk a little bit about your work on parole? And yes. How, yeah, how you started that. Yes, yep. Um, so I can actually also send out uh, the policy brief that I wrote. Um, so I recently wrote a policy brief looking at the current state of the absence of parole, of accessible parole in Maine. Um, so parole itself was abolished in 1976. So for over 40 years, if you have been incarcerated, then you don't have access. And so what that means is that the lengthy sentences, the life sentences and the de facto life sentences that were being handed down with a parole system are still being handed down without the opportunity for parole, without the opportunity to show that yes, I have engaged in this rehabilitative work. I have truly been transformed. This is what I'm doing and this is what I wanna do with my freedom. That doesn't matter. And that was recently shown just how much it doesn't matter in the case of Brandon Brown and his um, petitions for clemency, right? Master student, um, Finally, uh, he's going for his PhD now. Uh, he was a hospice volunteer when he was here. We worked on the same team together. He worked on the NAACP, um, tutored, mentored, facilitated classes. If, they, if, there's a, if there's a box on a checklist of what you need to do when you're incarcerated in order to qualify for parole, he can probably check them off. And he even had uh, people, uh, faculty from, um, from George Mason, from the Carter School, where he was um, going for his master's degree, and um, community members, and even state legislators pulling for him and speaking on his behalf, petitioning the governor to grant him clemency so that he could work towards his doctorate degree in person. And it was a no, a hard and fast no. And then when Jeff Evangelos, <laughs> bulldog as he is, you know, kept pushing and got them to reconsider, it was still a no. 
so thankfully we were able to work um, and get the structured community confinement program expanded where he is now thankfully out in society on home confinement. Um, but still, he can't go down to Virginia to do his, uh, his doctoral program in person. And that is a travesty. So this lack of incentive for rehabilitation is what really drives the need for parole, right? Because when you warehouse people, you don't create space for them to grow. You don't create space for them to heal. Because when you understand that most crime is created out of, well, most harm is created and crime as well is uh, created out of trauma, of harm, then you realize that healing needs to happen in order for someone to be able to grow. Because until you heal, it makes growing very, very difficult, if not near impossible. So with parole, um, I wrote a policy brief saying why we need it, um, because the current mechanisms fail to incentivize rehabilitation. Good time um, depends on when you were sentenced to how much you get, uh, and it's you don't really need to earn it. Uh, someone who gets up every day and mops a floor and plays PlayStation for the rest of the day and bugs the guards the rest of the day and is just a general nuisance and sits out in the day room talking trash all day, right? Um, that person gets the same amount of good time as the same per as someone who was sentenced under the same sentencing guidelines who gets their GED, who gets a college degree, who facilitates programs, who continues to grow and serve and find new ways to serve and create new ways to serve within the space. So good time fails. The commutation clause for clemency, that's a joke too, proven through Brandon. Uh, it exists to say that we have a mechanism for early release, but it has never been used, to my knowledge, it has never been used um, to release an incarcerated person. And uh, the supervised community confinement program, that offers 30 months of structured reentry. And that's great for someone serving six years because that those 30 months is about 42% of that sentence that gives the structured reentry. It gives the step down and support to scaffold you as you grow and find your place in society. But when you turn that six years into 60 years, that 42% becomes 4.2%. So those of us who need the most time, to transition into society, we get very little. Now, this is where parole, if implemented, right, and, and this is where you can help if you choose. Uh, LD842 was passed um, through the House and then killed in the Senate. Again, Jeff Evangelos, bulldog that he is, he managed to save it in an amended form, right, where it calls for the creation of a commission to examine reestablishing parole. And their duty is to create a bill that is safe for society because there wasn't the political will to acknowledge that the original bill is beautifully written. It has an evidence-based foundation and it is flexible enough for the evidence-based strategies that I put forth in my policy brief, right? Of front-loading resources, of using incentives uh, to get buy-in from people who will get on parole of um, engaging people in the work, right? When you take this approach and when you use, um, when you judge a person's resources by their risk, not just blanket, then these are evidence-based uh, strategies that reduce the potential for recidivism. They support people as they return to society and they can actually improve community safety. So that is my fight, that is, you know, I, I've, worked on a lot of different um, initiatives to deal with a lot of different issues that affect a lot of different people from recovery um, to reentry um, to prisoners' rights. So now my focus is on parole because you have a lot of people with a lot of skill, a lot of talent, and a lot of desire to do good and to, to do right in society who don't have opportunity. So that's my fight and I will 
very glad to receive any help I can get. Yeah, can you see the questions? Yep, um, so I'm scanning through right now. The one at the end. And the question is, is Colby involved in any capacity in these advocacy efforts for reintroducing parole in Maine? Should hear your thoughts about the ways. Thank you all for being here. Take care. Thank you. Sorry to have to run. That's okay. So, um, how can you individually and collectively support my efforts on the subject um, for parole? Uh, I think I kind of touched it, um, and I can send out. Uh, so, so what I did actually specifically, um, I reached out to sixteen media people or outlets. Um, asking them to do stories uh, around the need for parole and around the absence of parole. And I sent them a policy brief as well. And so any connections that you have um, to anyone in um, the legislature or the Senate or the governor herself or um, in the media, or even if you don't have contacts, this is a great opportunity for you to make contacts, to reach out and let people know that this is a need in this community and in the state that we need parole and this is why. And I, <laughs> I lay it right out for you. All the why, evidence-based, very well researched. Um, but yes, you, you can reach out to state lawmakers and you can reach out to um, the media to build support and build um, some momentum around this. I, I think it's sounds like you people, uh, we've been, so interested by your work that we have everybody's address, email address, and we'll send you that. <laughs> Can I ask a real quick question? I don't yeah. know much time, really quick. Um, you talked about earlier about standing alone is difficult, and you also talked about how um, the support you're receiving from, I guess, administrators there is more, is, is, is greater, I guess. So have you, based on what you talked about, about the you know, some things that you're passionate about and pushing for. Do you get any pushback from people? Not, I'm not talking about, um, uh, I'm talking about from other administrators or prison officials about some of the things you bring to life in these calls. So uh, it, it depends on um, who we're talking about because yes, I, I have had um, support and thankfully, Again, this is where my faith comes in. You know, God has given me his favor and the favor of man. So even those who, uh, some of them really hate the work that I do and they hate the support that I have and that I get. The grudging respect for what I do and for how I do it and for the, the way that I carry myself. Right, because I understand that there are people who are dead set against everything that I stand for. And some of these people are in positions of authority where they can pull the rug right out from underneath me and possibly set all of my work back by years and I can lose everything. And that, that, that's a reality too um, of this work, of, of doing any type of activism work in this this space is that people talk about how I can lose everything I have tomorrow, right? My reality is that I can lose everything that I have before the end of this call. When I leave this unit and I go down to pick up a meal, I can lose everything I have between here and there. Is it likely to happen? No. But is it possible? Very much so. And the minute that I lose sight of that, and start feeling a little bit too big for myself, then guess what? I will very quickly, I can confidently say that I will lose something pretty easily. But, but yeah, I, I don't get a lot of um, in your face pushback. Thank you. It's a great question. No, great question though, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thank you for your time. Your that was really amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure the other regretted that they had to leave early. 